So we're going to be trying out the HHM panel this year, um, see what they're going to announce for the Terratrum and the new haunted house. This is a line situation, it's super long, look at that. And it goes all the way to the outside. What are the dates for next year? And here's Claire. Summer Scream. Each year, our little spook show draws visitors from all over for a weekend of haunts and horror. And one visitor in particular comes an extra long way to be with all of you, proving that this community truly is universal. Bringing the evil from the Emerald Isle, please welcome to the stage the one the only creative director and executive producer of Universal Studios Hollywood's Halloween Horror Nights, John Murdy. I'm gonna chant all of your names. Just yell them all out. <laughs> How you guys doing today? I'm John Murdy. I'm the creative director, executive producer of Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Studios Hollywood. Welcome back to Midsummer Scream. We got a lot of stuff to show you guys today, but you guys know how this starts, right? Well, no, it's, actually it starts like this, okay? Thank you. That's a tradition, we gotta make, you know, seriously, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it's the fans of Halloween Horror Nights that fuel our passion for the event, that make our, ourselves and our team want to top, you know, top ourselves every single year. Uh, we appreciate all that as support, so thank you so much. And do we have in the house, do we have any, Team members from Halloween Horror Nights, anybody? Stand up, stand up. Stand up. It takes a village to do this event. It's not me. It's all of these people who work on this event, all the men and women who work on this event, year after year after year. It's their passion to give it up for them. All right. What should we do? By the pricking of my thumb, something wicked this way comes. You guys ready for an announcement right out of the game here?
Now I know what you're thinking. Has Texas Chainsaw Massacre ever been featured at Halloween Horror Nights in the past? Yes. yes, it has. What we're gonna take you through today, and I'm gonna do a deep dive into Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the legacy of Leatherface. This is an all new experience. I'm gonna show you why, but first, a short history lesson. So, Texas Chainsaw Massacre goes all the way back to the very beginning of our era of Halloween Horror Nights. It was one of the first intellectual properties that we featured at our event. In 2007, we did Texas Chainsaw Massacre back in business. Anybody see this? Anybody in the crowd around back then? A lot of you who saw that original house said it was the scariest house that we ever produced. Is that true? Okay, so that's the bar, right? That's the bar, we knew we had to top ourselves, but we did it in 2007, it actually wasn't based on the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it was based on the 2003 remake. So in 2008, we did the exact same thing. Because <laughs> we did that back then. You know, back when I first started doing Halloween Horror Nights, I came from Universal Creative, from doing like rides like Revenge of the Mummy, and then when we took on, it celebrates its 20th anniversary this year, but then when we, when we took on Halloween Horror Nights, you know, the first years that we were doing it, we were like, oh, cool, everybody liked that, let's just do it again. So in 2008, we did Texas Chainsaw Massacre back in business, exact same house, and then four years went by. And then in 2012, we did Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Saw is the Law. That's the first house we did based on the original 1974 classic film. Quick personal story. You see the scene, what's the scene? Yeah, the dining room, the dinner table scene. That particular year, I brought my uh, father-in-law and my mother-in-law from Ireland to Halloween Horror Nights for the first time. When we got to the scene, the path goes around to the left. My father-in-law, he'd never been in a haunted house, he went around to the right and he sat down in that bone chair and he just started chatting up Grandpa. <laughs> and the poor performer's like, what the hell's going on? And then Leatherface came running into the room with a chainsaw and my mother-in-law tried to smack him. And I'm like, no, no, you can't do this. But in 2012, that's the first time we did the original Chainsaw Massacre. And then 2016, four years later, do you see the trend starting to develop here? For all you conspiracy theorists in the house. We did Texas Chainsaw Massacre Blood Brothers. And this was much more horror. That's what this franchise means to the whole genre of horror. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary of that historic franchise. So the people that we've always dealt with over the years on Texas Chainsaw Massacre, they came to me and they pitched me this idea. This is what they said. They said, why don't you take a multiverse approach to this classic franchise, right? And I went, yes, let's do that, that's awesome. Let's do a multiverse approach. And then I panicked. Because I had no idea how to do that. So what did I do? I do what I always do. I went back to the film, even though I've seen it a million times and started researching the film. And this particular line was the seed for everything I'm gonna show you right now. There, you know the scene, right? It's an idyllic summer afternoon. There's a group of teenagers driving in a van. They're driving through Muerto County, Texas. And they see this dude in the distance, waving and jumping up and down. And they decide, well, you should never do in a horror movie. Don't ever do this in real life. They decided, oh, look at that crazy guy. Let's let him in our car. Let's give him a ride. And he says these lines, my family has always been in meat. What's he talking about? The slaughterhouse. He says, oh, there was, you know, I used to work at the slaughterhouse, and my brother did, and my grandpa. And I thought to myself, you never see that in the original film. They talk about the slaughterhouse, but you never see it. So what we decided to do was to create an alternate timeline. This is where it gets real heavy, okay, so follow me. We decided to create an alternate timeline that runs parallel to the events in the 1974 film, but that takes place entirely at this location you've never been to, the slaughterhouse. Because if I know the Sawyer family from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which I do, I know that if there's a slaughterhouse that 
they all used to work at that's been sitting there abandoned, they're probably doing something with it, right? So that meant in research, I needed to learn everything I possibly could about slaughterhouses and meat production. So that was the next phase of my research. I don't recommend this, by the way. <laughs> this messed me up. I spent hours and hours and hours researching slaughterhouses. In fact, this is the first treatment I've ever written that I had to put a disclaimer on the cover page, like a warning to any of our team members that were gonna read this. And if all of you who work at Halloween Horror Nights are here, you know I'm telling the truth, right? Right on the front page, big, huge letters. In fact, most of my research imagery, I can't even show you. I didn't put it in the deck because it's really, really, really awful. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's time for a slightly longer history lesson than the one we had before. Um, it starts with this date, December 25th, 1865. Does anybody have any idea what that date has to do with anything besides the fact that it's Christmas? This happened. The Union Stockyard in Chicago opened its doors for the first time. So, um, I had to come up with a way to tell this backstory, right? So I wrote a script for Nubbin Sawyer, also sometimes referred to as the Hitchhiker. I didn't voice it, but I'm gonna do it for you so you get the idea. This is how we're gonna set up the experience. Do you guys like when we have a live character up yes. front of the yeah. Well, it's not Nubbins, but I'll show you what it is in a second. But you hear his voice while you're waiting in line, and he says this. My family's always been in meat. We used to work at the slaughterhouse. All us Sawyers, me, my brothers, Grandpa too. He was the best killer that ever there was. But the place got shut down on account of them government contracts drying up after the wars. We was destitute. But you can always find meat if you know where to look. Animals hitting the road by them trunks passing through? Sick ones, farmers put down. But when they moved the main road, meat got harder to find. My brothers and I tried digging some up from the graveyard, but the people wasn't dying fast enough. Like I said, my family's always been in meat. And if there's meat to be had, a Sawyer's will find it. I think I just ripped off, like, you know, Chop Top. <laughs> I think I switched from, like, the Hitchhiker to Chop Top halfway through. But thank you, appreciate that. Um, so this is the facade. The facade is the abandoned slaughterhouse. It's been sitting empty for a couple of decades, ever since the contracts dried up after World War II, Korea. It closed, it was surrounded by fences, but the Sawyers took it back over again. Why? Because they can conceal all the things they're doing from the authorities. So while you're waiting in line, getting ready to enter the slaughterhouse, you're hearing that voiceover that I was just doing, and then this guy walks in. This is Leatherface from a 2017 film called Leatherface, a prequel. He's got a big cow head over his own, and that's what we're doing with this house. We are gonna do every iteration of Leatherface <laughs> from all nine films in the franchise. We're bringing them all together. So he comes out, and he's looking at you, and he sizes you up, and then he starts kind of gesturing to you with one hand, and then he turns around, and you see on the back, he's got the words, follow, written in blood, and then he walks back through the steel door that he came through, and you have to follow him. Now, one of the creative challenges of this was, okay, so we're gonna take all these different iterations of Leatherface, and we're gonna have them in one house. But how is that gonna make sense? So again, I went back to the original 1974 film. Do you guys know Gunnar Hansen who played Leatherface? Well, I read a bunch of interviews with him, and when he was doing the original role, he described Leatherface in this way. He said he had no, and this is real slaughterhouse. This is like the, one of the few pictures I could actually show you from my research. Um, you notice how there, there's all these like twists and turns? 
That was done intentionally in slaughterhouses. They found out really early on if it was just a straight line, the animals would go and then would stop. And then they wouldn't go any further. So that's why there's always twists because you don't know what's coming around the corner, right? Crude to me, it's the exact same philosophy with building haunted houses. We've been doing this for years. We always are like, let's have lots of twists and turns. It's like an animal pen because you don't know what's coming around the corner. But in this case, what's coming around the corner is what they called in the slaughterhouses the prodder and the stunner. And in this case, the prodder is Chop Top. He's just back from Vietnam. He's still got his army jacket on. He's gonna have a cattle prod and he's gonna be prodding you to the stunner, which in this case is gonna be Leatherface from the 2003 remake. He's up on a platform. He's got a big sledgehammer, so Chop Top setting him up. Leatherface is knocking him down. That takes you to the next room we call the killing floor. Um, and this is another weird thing I came across in my research. This is actually a postcard that people bought from the Chicago stockyards. Believe it or not, this place was a tourist attraction. It was like the first theme park. Thousands and thousands of people went there to get guided tours every day of the slaughterhouse. It sounds insane, like who would do that today? But this one guy um, invented something called the Hereford Wheel, which is a way to get the animals up into the air and onto the disassembly line, so we decided to build our own. But we also have this giant mound of corpses when you come in, and seated on top of the corpses is Grandpa on his bone throne. In the original film, they talk about how great he was, how he could kill all these, you know, cattle, and you know, and they would he could have killed more if the hook and pull guys could get the beeves out of the way. So this is our cast from the killing room. Um, you have Grandpa. He's up on his bone throne. He's whacking Bunny Foo Foo on the head with a mallet. Well, it's not a bunny, so you don't worry. It's a human, that makes it okay. <laughs> Down below is, uh, is Dumbins, or the hitchhiker, prodding him on, and then you into the skinning room. Now, this is always a classic scene we like to do with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We call it the face peel. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? So in this scene, we take Leatherface from the 2006 prequel to the remake, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the beginning, where he's wearing that weird leather mask. He's got a meat cleaver in one hand, and he is chopping a, a guy we just refer to as the meat. <laughs> he's chopping his legs into mincemeat, and he's taking a, a skinning knife, and he's cutting along his chin line and slowly peeling his face off. Then we take you into a transition that we simply call the hallway of horrors, where you have to walk through skinned bodies. And when I say you have to walk through skinned bodies, I don't mean bodies with their skin removed. I mean the skin itself. You have to walk through their skin. And there's a surprise waiting for you at the end. And I'm not gonna tell you what it is. Because this is something new. We invented just for this house. And I think we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Another role in the slaughterhouse, and it was always described. You gummed up the works again. Get down here and tame out the screen trap. Um, this is a water scene. You've seen our water scenes, right? So, Gook is pouring in through these big drains, filling up the floor with not really water. It's kind of like stew. It's like got body parts in it and thick and it's bubbling and it's oozing and it smells delightful. Did you guys think Exorcist smelled bad last year? Yeah. I apologize in advance for the factory sensation you are all going to experience. And I don't know, you're cheering. <laughs> you're like, yes, we love bad smells. Um, Chop Top is pushing an old cart that he's got a collection of just slop and blech, stuff that he's been picking up off the slaughterhouse floor and dumping into the water and trying to get it to go down the drains. We call it the Nubbins cart because it's a special effect. Um, do you know Nubbins, his little corpse puppet that he carries around in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2? You know, there's a surprise with him. We'll have to wait to see it when you go. Um, but while Chop Top is screaming, Leatherface comes into the scene to chase you out of the room and out of the slaughterhouse altogether, and that's gonna be Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Now at this point, you're outside. You're on the loading dock. You've left the, you've finally gotten out of the slaughterhouse. 
And this is where the research comes back into play. Remember I was talking about refrigerated train cars that had ice that kept the meat cool? Yeah, we'll see the Sawyer family, they're not too handy. They're not too good with technology. They're not too mechanically inclined. Um, so there's a generator. It's this horrible rigged together generator that they've used to keep the lights on, but just barely. Um, but they never really got around to figuring out this refrigerated train car. Okay? Now you know you're going to have to go in there, right? You don't want to go in there, trust me. But there's going to be somebody to make sure you go in there, and that's going to be Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Now he roars up with his chainsaw, drives you inside the refrigerated train car, and this is Texas, right? All of these carcasses have just been sitting there outside. You're in the woods. You're heading to this weird looking graveyard, but it's not the graveyard from the original film. It's the Sawyer family graveyard for all the members of the Sawyer family who lived, worked, and died in the slaughterhouse. Because safety wasn't a big deal when these places were run back in the old days. So a whole lot of them lost limbs, lost arms, or just flat out died. They drug them outside, they hammered a couple of boards together, wrote their name, Bubba, Zedekiah, Malachiah, stuck it in the ground and buried them. But then they, you know, it's the Sawyer family, they're weird. So um, they, one night they went down to the local like butcher shop in town and they stole one of those pig statues that always used to be in front of butcher shops. They usually had a pig and he was dressed like a chef and they hauled that back to the slaughterhouse and they set it up like a religious statue because to the Sawyers, meat is their guide's top story and someone changes the channel. And then out of the darkness, out of the woods around you, Leatherface, the pretty woman look again from the 1974 film, comes racing at you, drives you inside, and now you're heading towards that classic steel door from the original film, right back to the first murder that happens in the film. So all these things have been happening, were happening right before then, and now you're confronted with Leatherface in the steel door, and I think we'll leave it there. You know, hey, how many of you guys, like, how many of you guys love this particular film, the original 1974, Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Yeah. It is, it's, like I said, it's one of the most classic films, and not only the entire genre of horror, but it's, it's, you know, it's a classic film full stop, right? And you look at this scene, right? This is the classic sunset dance scene at the end of the movie where he's just, you know, doing his thing with his chainsaw. And you, it's such an icon of horror that we forget what it looked like when they were making it. That's what it looked like. These were a bunch of, you know, former students, not in Hollywood, you know, out in Texas, making this movie, low budget horror, with their friends in like 100 degree heat, working crazy hours. And this group of people made something that's lasted this long. I think that's pretty amazing. Yeah, and in particular, these two gentlemen. Kim Henkel, who wrote, co-wrote Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and that gentleman with the beard, Toby Hooper. Give it up for Toby Hooper. <laughs> Toby Hooper co -wrote. Okay, you know, just the other day we announced a brand new house that continues the Universal Monsters legacy at Halloween Horror Nights. Started in 2018 with Universal Monsters. This is the sixth that we have done at Universal Studios Hollywood, and this one is called Universal Monsters Eternal Bloodlines. So what's different about this house? Um, this is the first time we've ever done a completely female-centric take on the Universal Monsters using characters that are um, rooted in our film history, except one which we invented, which I'll tell you about in just a second, um, but bringing these characters to light that maybe are lesser known than some of our you know, standard characters that everybody knows. Um, we did this in collaboration with our colleagues at Universal Orlando, so Chris and I worked with their team to create this original story. So this is a completely original story, um, and I'm gonna show you the monsters. So let's meet the monsters. Let's start with the heroines. Saskia von Helsing. This is a completely
the original character. It doesn't exist in the novel, doesn't exist in the films. And I should give credit to the great Crash McCreary. Do you guys know Crash? Legendary creature creator. He works with us on the Universal Monsters franchise. He does a house. The Bride of Frankenstein lives. Do you remember that house? We listen. We listen to you guys. I was like, we gotta bring the bride back. She's such a great character, such a great house. Uh, we've kind of taken, uh, and this is Crash's artwork again, and it's inspired by what Lucas Colshaw on our team drew for the Monster Hunter look from Bride of Frankenstein Lives. Um, and of course, she's inspired by our 1935 film, The Bride of Frankenstein, which she is in for exactly, what, five minutes, <laughs> right? Dracula's Daughter, that comes from a real universal movie, it was 1936, the Countess Maria Zaleska, um, it was Dracula's Daughter, it was the first sequel they made to Dracula. Um, this is Crash's artwork for the mid-transformation look of Dracula's Daughter. But we, you know, we thought, okay, cool, let's take that farther. So when she gets fully transformed, oh. She looks like this. You guys cool if I share a sneak peek? Yeah! yeah. Um, little makeup. Um, so this is Patrick McGee, McGee Effects, our longtime makeup artist. This is his sculpt for the mid-transformed Dracula's daughter. And then we decided to bring, you know, a couple Easter eggs, a couple of little surprises from the past. Some I'll tell you about, some I won't. Um, we decided to bring one of Dracula's brides back. So this is the mask for Dracula's bride. She factors into the story. And then we decided to pair this character with two other female universal monsters, starting with the She-Wolf, inspired by our 1946 film, The She-Wolf of London. There's Anksu the Moon. Inspiration, our 1932 film, The Mummy. In that movie, uh, Imhotep, who gets reincarnated as Ardeth Bay, uh, becomes obsessed with this woman named Helen, who's up on screen right now. Um, and he wants to take her and sacrifice her so he can turn her back into his long lost love, Anaksu Moon. Moon. Um, so we took that idea and we ran with it and we created this. Uh, so this is the look of our female mummy in our experience. Uh, you recognize the amulet of Ra that she's wearing around her neck. That's a throwback to our 2022 house. Universal Monsters Legends Collide. That's what the mummy was wearing over and over and over is when are you gonna do like an album with the music from Universal Monsters? Oh. <laughs> For the first time ever this year at Halloween Horror Nights, you'll be able to get a limited edition vinyl album uh, featuring uh, selections of all of the different houses that Slash has done up until this point. Um, That's so this is the interior sleeve, you know, they will be the inside. <laughs> All right. Should we announce the scare zone? Yes! All right. Yes, anywhere. Pat Quinn on our team does all of the uh, scare zones and park decor for the park. He has been pitching this idea for a scare zone to Chris and I for years. And we've never said yes. And then this year we went, let's do it. It's one of the craziest ideas I've ever heard for a scare zone, but I dig it. And what it's inspired by is Luchador Cinema. Do you guys know what that is? It's, it's a specific genre of horror that is specific to Mexico, really. Particularly in the 60s and 70s. They would make movies with famous wrestlers and they would pit them against monsters. Like, not our Frankenstein, but usually a Frankenstein. Not our Dracula, but there was always a Dracula. Not our Wolfman, but there was always a Wolfman. Not our mummy, but there was always a mummy. Um, so Pat's idea was to make monster wrestlers that are fighting monster wrestlers, okay? Uh, so I'm gonna share with you the good monstros. Okay. The Blue Death. 
And what's really cool about this is working with our DEI team, um, we sourced all these costumes from, from Latin America, from the very people that make luchador wrestling costumes. Um, so everything's authentic. This is uh, the Blue Death. This is his tag team partner, the Green Devil. And then there's the Bad Monstros. <laughs> the cave monster, who's not Frankenstein, but he kind of looks like him. The horror wolf, who's not the wolf man, but he kind of looks like him. It's in the spirit of these movies. The water demon, who's not the creature of the Black Lagoon, he kind of looks like him. The Bruja, the witch. Oh. The skeleton man. Yeah. The night zombie. Oh. And our still walking character, oh. the bat. And here's the whole cast. Let's go! Uh, this is gonna be tied to our Latin American house, Monstros 2, The Nightmares of Latin America. Oh. So you can come out of this house, you can right into that particular scare zone. Um, thank you, by the way, because I owe that to you guys, too. It was you who got us doing this in the first place. Years ago, back in 2009, I think, a fan, more than one, came up to me and were like, why, why don't you do La Llorona? And I had no idea what that was, because it wasn't something I grew up with in my culture. Um, but I started researching it, and I started getting into it, and I realized, wow, this is amazing. It's so Los Angeles. It's so representative of our community. This is what his finished mask look like. This is a partnership with Immortal Masks. Um, and they might be here today, uh, but they do our silicone masks for the event and they created some amazing masks for this one. Um, we're also creating original artwork, luchador posters in the style of that artwork from the 50s, 60s. This is just a few examples. And you know, earlier today I signed that beautiful piece of artwork that our, our own Lucas Colshot did from Monstros uh, for people that... Nice! Whoa! I'm on Colescope. Note to self. Oh, God. You're not supposed to see that. Sorry. Whoa! All right. Span appreciation time. Um, you know how this works, right? We're going to give away two express passes to HHN and an exclusive behind the scenes tour with yours truly of a house of my choosing. <laughs> Which is going to be the closest house it takes me to get to before the next place I have to go to. <laughs> um, but we're going to give that away. We've been doing this every year of, of Midsummer Scream. And before I do that, I wanted to give it up to the people who create, produce, run Midsummer Scream. They're an amazing people. They do an amazing job. Uh, it's a pleasure to do this show every single year. Again, I want to give it up to you, the fans of this event. Um, your support through the years means so much to not only myself, but all the men and women who work on Halloween Horror Nights all year long to bring it to life. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So there's always a trivia question, right? You guys ready? Wait for it. There is no trivia question this year. I'm giving those tickets away to my family. No, I'm just kidding. No, there seriously is no trivia question this year, because I thought about this. Right before I came over for this show, I thought, this show is all about the spirit of home haunts, right? And earlier today, I did a panel um, called Home Hunt to Pro Hunt with a bunch of different people in our industry talking about how we started out. So I have a question for you. How many home haunters are in the audience? If you're a home hunter, keep your hand up. Okay. And do we have, and be honest, any of you that do home hunts, is one of your kids the driving creative force in what you do? Yeah. Yeah? Keep your hand up if it's true. Okay, pointing over here. All right. Come on up. Right there where you're pointing. Come on up. I don't think you can actually get on stage because there's no, like, steps. What's your name? What is it? Wolf? If I 
Country Wolf. I dig your name. <laughs> do you do home haunts, Wolf? And are you the driving creative force behind it? Okay, this is your Willy Wonka moment. You know what I mean? <laughs> this is the golden ticket, Wolf. Are you ready for this? You're gonna have to have one of your parents come with you, okay? I'm gonna take you and your parents. We're gonna give you two express passes free for Halloween Horror Nights, and I'm gonna give you a behind the scenes tour and show you how we do this. Thank you. You're the next generation, my friend. Thank you. They're gonna get together with you, they're gonna give you what you need. And we're going to show you a good time. Thank you, Wolf. And for everybody right here, he's going to take care of you. Mario's going to hook you up. I just wanted to do that a little different this year because, hey, <laughs> we got to look to the next generation. But for all of you, thank you so much. Thank you for supporting this event. Thank you for being a part of Halloween Horror Nights. We'll see you in the fall. Alright, this is it. This is the last right, time. Guys. This is the end of our trip to Halloween Horror Nights. <laughs> to Midsummer Scream. To Midsummer Scream. Yeah. It's it over. Midsummer Scream That's is over. I guess, I guess we'll be back next year. See you at Midsummer Scream in 2025 in August. Yep. Hey, who knows? Maybe we'll get Golden Bat. Gold Bat. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder why they did August though. <laughs>